Hi, everyone. I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm here today with Jen Starzik, the costume designer on the new Wrestling Wing themed fact based feature from A24, The Iron Claw. Jen, uh, let's start by noting that this film is based on a true story and these were real people whose attire you were depicting. So, to a large degree, I imagine this was kind of a massive period research project for you. Oh, absolutely. Um, I should also start by saying I was completely unfamiliar with not only the Von Erichs, but really the I, I was unfamiliar with wrestling. And I was maybe had some preconceived notions of what wrestling was, and they were completely shattered while working on this movie um, for the best. I'm like such a huge, I didn't know much about it, except for what you kind of assume it would be. And instead, I found out it was live theater. It is uh, these these insanely athletic, talented people that not only have to be completely strong and inhumane uh, with strength, but choreography, there's costumes, there's showmanship. I mean, it was just like the most exciting thing to kind of get into. And I was like, oh, a whole nother element of life theater. I wasn't aware of it was such a gift. And obviously when, after I'd read the script of, read Sean's script, I was like, this is a beautiful story, a tragic story, um, such an interesting story. There's so many, so many nuances there, especially in our movie in particular with just just patriarchy and brotherhood and wanting to strive and where that gets you in life and and success and then the nuances of wrestling and wrestling's its own thing as an ancient sport but also very masculine but there's dress up involved I mean there's all sorts of interesting things happening there so my first dive was just to look at the Von Erics and what they looked at and once I saw they were just this era of early 1980s, mainly of um, rural, but still, you know, Americana, Texas. I was immediately hooked, fell in love and was like, I need to design this movie. <laughs> so that's, that's how it came out. How cool, though. I mean, you're right. Live theater is right. I mean, until the 60s or maybe even 70s, Jen, I think there was still debate on whether professional wrestling was was real or not. <laughs> um, I think we have long since come to the conclusion that no, no, it is theater. But I was a big professional wrestling fan in my youth. And I remember thinking, well, these guys don't wear much. And um, <laughs> this would have been in the late 60s, early 70s. And they didn't wear much more in the 80s. But uh, for you, um, it's still got to be about way more than, you know, short shorts and tank tops and knee pads. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, and even thinking that, of course, I think you're going to think wrestling there, they just have on like speedos, you know, for a lack of a better word, but, um, you know, for when you're designing a film and you have such um, an amazing cast and you're making a made to order film and basically almost all in the entirety of those wrestling matches were made to order, custom made to order. And there were about 20 matches going into it. I'm not too sure what the count is by the time it was edited in our final movie, but we did have a lot of variants in there and you have a lot of different body types. So we had to um, specifically cut a pattern for each of our cast, I mean, Zach and Jeremy and Harris and everybody else's body is completely different. So not only did it have to look um, correct from the front, from the back, from the side, but it also had to be kind of period accurate and try to convey the wrestling trunk style of that time, which was a little bit higher, kind of hit around the belly button area. It wasn't as skimpy as you imagine. And also getting a comfort level for each actor, because of course they're the one on the camera, they're performing, they did most of their own stunts. So they needed to know where they wanted to hit on them. So we would kind of come up with some like the best possible scenario. And then we um, we luckily partnered with this, we had so much, so much made to order in such a small amount of time. And making those trunks, you actually need a specific machine for, which we did not have. And it was quite expensive if we were to buy one. And then we'd have to find a crew to even make those trunks in like a 24 hour period. So we were lucky enough to have a sport company, a wrestling company called High Spots. And we were like, hey, if we told you our schedule and we gave you this NDA, could you maybe help make these shorts for us? We had, I think of a hundred pairs of trunks we had to make. And um, we proceeded to make little packets for each character. We would pattern them out ourselves, our cutter fitter. We would give them the materials, the fabrics, we'd give them an illustration and off they went and they came back. And if it wasn't for them, it would have been, I mean, I don't think we would have been able to have, have managed it. And then we had our ring robes, which for our story, like these boys, the Von Eriks were so um, 
uh, you know, revolutionary with their time because they had, it was a, kind of a static sport before then, as you'd mentioned. And then um, they obviously implemented the use of multi-camera and using music when they walk in. And they had they had a bit of a persona that they took off and, and they really were the pioneers of that look. I mean, this was before uh, so many people came out maybe growing upon them like a Hulk Hogan or something of the 90s as you got to the end of it with the brothers. But um, so it was kind of an amazing way to, I still don't know who made their ring robes. That's the one question I'd love to know the answer to. Was it Doris? Was it somebody in their family? Was it some local dry cleaner? I don't know. But there was that element of uh, homemade quality, but they were polished and they had a lot of personality and be dazzling and all sorts of interesting elements in them to, to grow upon. So it was awesome. It was all very rock and roll. I think it started to become like rock and roll and flash. And you're right, before that, it was still kind of sporty and, you know, almost more coming out of the Greco-Roman era, you know, of, of real wrestling. But yes, then it just turned into complete theater. Um, but as you said, it was amazing that you found kind of these authentic costumes in this original vendor um, to be able to give you, uh, I imagine they had to churn stuff out really quickly in your schedule for you. Yes, they probably probably a couple of the people involved were like, why did we take this call in the first place? Because we had to do the same thing with the wrestling boots, um, because there's wonderful boot makers and shoemakers um, in Los Angeles that work for films and have, you know, they obviously understand the deadline and custom made shoes. But when we gave them our schedule, they um, couldn't even fit us in. So. I had uh, looked on Instagram. I was like, somebody has to be making it's also a, a more of a, now they're a little bit more, um, not in general, but mainly like motorcycle looking. They're like a heavier boot as compared to like a 1980s circa late seventies boot. So I needed somebody that would also have the finesse of knowing what that toe shape was and the fit and, and so on and so forth. So I had Googled or looked on Instagram, like Von Eric wrestling boots. Well, of course, Kevin's known for not wearing any, but like, so I was like, Kerry Von Eric wrestling boots or something like that. And somebody had popped up and next thing you know, I'm DMing Ray from Ace Boots. And I'm like, hi, can I send you an NDA? Could we talk about making boots for a movie? And he was tickled pink. He's from Texas. You know, he's wrestling's a big part of his culture and it's what his career is. So he, he took that call as well and also had to be under tremendous um, just uh, stress and demand with the schedule. Twice he had to personally drive the boots to us after them being made and curing because uh, we had offered to meet somebody halfway or this and that from like one part of Texas to where we were shooting Baton Rouge. But he was like, I'm going to do it myself and I'll know that you have them. Like it was. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> So, I, can, I can just imagine it's almost like a drug deal. Hey, you got the boots. Yeah, yes, got the yeah. Has the eagle landed? Yeah, exactly. It was so, <laughs> it was so cool. <laughs> and, you know, you arrive the day of and you're like, here's the costume. Nobody has to know about the whole backstory until now, you know. <laughs> right. But it's it's great to have the backstory. I, I mean, you are you obviously careful to give each of the brothers his own distinct kind of fashion style inside that sort of overall Texas Americana kind of overview. Um, and they did all have their own their own style, um, which was interesting. Uh, you must have had a truckload of uh, wrestling videos uh, that you looked at uh, what, on YouTube of the Von Erich brothers to draw from, along with what? I know there was a Vice documentary and a book to guide you. All of that had to help. Oh, tremendous impact. And I think the first thing I watched was Dark Side of the Ring. Um, that was which... the Vice doc. Yeah, that was the vice one and heroes of WCCW wrestling, which was very informative. And there's, you know, obviously elements in our film from there, from some interviews and things like that, because it was, you know, it, it highlights all the things in the Von Eric's life. And then Sean had shared a list of the wrestling matches and um, that they were trying to, they were gonna whittle down or something. So I had gone into, I love doing my own research anyhow, cause that's the only way it's, it's gonna like process into your mind. And I like just did a deep dive into, you could find all of them on YouTube. So it was so cool. And um, just watch them again and again with my jaw dropping and Lord knows what like the fabulous Freebirds are gonna come out wearing and I don't know what else. And so it was just so amazing. And then, you know, trying to get your screenshots and get all your, your information together. Um, to make sure that you're going to, you know, you want to honor these this this family and um, make sure that you know, hopefully, our work is executing that as well as possible. And definitely, each of those boys had their own look. I mean, Kevin, I describe as like kind of the all around 
like the jock, the American jock. And his ring robe seemed to always have the same silhouette, almost of like a zip up hoodie. So he had like a little hood in the back and just was open and, but it still had a little bit of jazz. There was some bedazzling on the cuffs and on the, the waistband and kind of sparkling fabric to like catch the light, which we enhanced, you know, maybe it would have, in my knowledge, maybe not have been super expensive fabric. And we ended up getting this very expensive fabric because it would have the most sheen and luminosity and, and like the most, you know, illustrious with our lighting that our DP was using because the Sportatorium obviously is a nighttime dark, place with smoky atmosphere. So we wanted to make sure we caught as much as we could be, you know, of those elements of those ring robes. And then of course, David is the yellow rose of Texas, basically. I mean, he's like the Western, you know, a little bit of country, a little bit of rock and roll. And I um, mean, you know, we it was also going through with Sean deciding which matches start mid-match because they wouldn't need an entry ring robe and which ones that we would hopefully catch them walking in. And, um, and so that helped eliminate or or basically, you know, get us the things to like which how many like David only needed a couple robes by the end of it. So you're like, OK, I need to make the yellow robes of Texas. I need to make this weird Western rock star thing <laughs> with like Western flange and like stars and stuff. And um, and then he had one other, which is very simple. We wanted to make sure they also had like an arc between when they started and when they ended and it got more rock star and more elaborate as it went on and brighter. Um, and Carrie's, Carrie's vibe is definitely like he's the 1980s rock star, I would say the most. He wore sometimes some headbands and he had like, he just mostly had more of like a little shorty robe, like a robe that you'd wear out of the shower. That's how I would describe his silhouette. And so those were the biggest things because when we got to Mike, he kind of got dragged into wrestling later and his whole character was mostly never fitting in. It was always these pictures of the brothers like, you know, and trunks and working out and buff. And then Mike would be like in a polo and corduroy shorts, like not fitting in at all. So we kind of wanted to make sure that we told the story of Mike wanting something different. We, and we, we took it like he wanted to be a musician and sort of uh, had a little backstory there with that idea. You used, had to, I think you used a lot of other materials too, didn't you, Jen, for ideas and inspiration for dressing everyone um, outside the ring to depict the era too, like, what magazines and catalogs and movies and TV shows, just all kinds of stuff. You 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 didn't eliminate anything for ideas. Oh no, not at all. One of my favorite things is is to collect the ideas. And I always um I always start with sort of looking at some pop culture references and what movies were popular around that time and maybe a little bit of backdating. So I think the first thing I watched was Smokey and the Bandit, <laughs> which is an amazing film in its own. Um, and I was pleased to, when I got to the set, unbeknownst to me, the set decorator had a Smokey and the Bandit poster in the in the room. And I was like, oh, we're on the same page. There's nothing better than that. Um, yeah. I always like to keep like a, a TV show on in the background for me as I, as I do um, at any of my work, basically, that's a period work. And so for this one, I picked Dallas because it makes the most sense. I had not watched Dallas. I became very obsessed with Dallas. I would come into work and I'd be like, you got to hear what happened to Sue Ellen. Like I was at, like, was I saying something's <laughs> work happening at the first time? My crew was like, enough already. Um, You're really and like, reliving the 80s. Yeah, totally. Yes, definitely. I was like, this was so ahead of its time. Um, but it helps you with the silhouette, with patterns, what people were wearing. Obviously, there was a little bit over the top there and that worked for us. And um, there was something that kind of tracked even between JR's character and Dave's character. They There was this cowboy hat that they don't make anymore that has, it's a little bit of a higher crown that was popular then. And that was 1980. It was probably taken from the 1880s, right? And um, <laughs> Stetson, we had reached out to Stetson to recreate it for us. And of course, we got a hold of someone that followed the Van Eriks, grew up in Texas, loved the Von Eriks, was like, I can't wait to, you know, help make this crown for you. I know exactly what you're talking about. You don't even need to send me anything. Like they were already just so familiar with that idea. And they kindly helped us with a couple hats for David in that, in that aspect as well. And then we always, like, I always think when you do a movie or a character, you're thinking, where do these people live? And what kind of income do they have? And what would be accessible for them to shop? So I did, rather think this is rural Texas. They weren't really 
Dallas and Denton are two different worlds, we could say. And they grew up on a ranch. They were they would had tons of ranch chores and went to church and did all sorts of other things aside from wrestling and were and were brothers and were family. And so to me, it was just very basic clothing that could have been at Sears or Montgomery Wards or whatever was around at that time. And um, and sometimes that clothing is a bit uh it's not muted and subdued and elegant, maybe even a bit dialed up or like, you know, a brighter color of that sense or, you know, brighter, brighter denim, something of that world. So that's sort of what I thought about for their everyday clothes. A little, and, over, a little over the top. A little over the top. Exactly. I mean, like, let's take, for instance, David wore what I called the midnight cowboy jacket. Like I was like, what is this? He's wearing this amazing fringe suede jacket over a football jersey with his cowboy hat and snakeskin boots. I mean, it's just like, I want to dress like him. Like I thought he just looked so amazing. So Joe Buck. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yes. And, um, and Carrie kind of making sure we did turn up, like we could use a lot of color on him and, and more of that 1980s palette of like coral and teal, little Miami vice colors, as you would call it. And, um, I think some of the grounding books, like something of like beautiful inspiration was um, Richard Davidon's America West, where he just has these people, there's these gorgeous photos of like late seventies, just real life people. And, um, and um, some other photography books of that sort, like I was saying before, Jeff Winningham's and uh, just some, some beautiful books that kind of just convey that sense of feeling to me, like a little country, a little rock and roll. If it said like Linda Ronstadt meets Crystal Gale meets Rush, I was in. <laughs> Perfect. Um, you also got to dress everyone at a wedding uh, scene. That had to be a, a huge amount of fun. Also taking the whole 1980s dynamic into sort of, uh, sort of upscale or a little upscale. Oh, uh, absolutely, 100%. The, um, the wedding was a total blast and in real life looking at pictures i think the picture i could at least find on on the internet of kevin and pam's wedding it was actually very simple and quiet and um she sort of had just like an off the shoulder and a an, um, dress and a see-through hat that was kind of popular at the time it was like in 16 candles for their wedding scene um but our wedding took place in the winter and there was a picture of carrie von eric's one of his weddings and it was this total very 80s matching tuxedo you know almost like a morning tuxedo look and uh, like the big poofy 80s and I just was like if not now when and, and we were able to find this gentleman in the midwest who actually owns a lot of vintage tuxedos still he does it for films and so we got a, a nice gray scale there and then obviously for Lily James it's I mean she was Cinderella for goodness sake so like not that yeah. silhouette of a tiny and like a big poofy skirt just looks so amazing amazing on her I mean everything looks amazing on her so I had some different silhouettes to try on her that were indicative of the time but once we got to that silhouette I was like I'll be right back with the biggest crinoline I can find and when I went to go get the crinoline there was like white cowboy boots in like the bridal store and I was like and the white cowboy boots will come too like it was <laughs> it was perfect yeah but you did I also read Jen that you you had you designed the looks for more than 200 background actors too what a what a job my god yeah we had that was um that was an interesting i guess um challenge because they had uh it's kind of coming out of covid and people were doing groups of background at the time so you had your core group they would call it and they would hopefully everybody was trustworthy and testing and doing their thing to try to keep the movie moving forward basically um and so those same 150 or 200 people or so were just redressed in like every scene basically. And for our wrestling matches, you had, like I said, you had like 20 mass matches. So you would shuffle people around and redress them and just keep that ball rolling and try to be as efficient as possible. Also tell a timeline because we started in 19, I think the first match was 79 or 80 and ends later on. So you wanted to see if you could introduce things as you went on and, and the boys got more popular. We had made um, Von Erich like merchandise. You Unfortunately, you don't really see not all that got onto the screen for the final cut, but you had some people in Von Eric t-shirts and I heart, you know, Kevin buttons and 
Um, their tour managers, you could say, there was pictures of them online. We recreated their, there was like satin bomber jackets, very eighties with like a high cowboy hat. So we made sure we had all that with Von Eric tour on the back and embroidered. So that was so much fun, but yeah, we just kept, you got to know them. They were nice. You knew what their body shape was. It was like, what did you wear? Yeah. Okay. Out here, we can do something else. And <laughs> It was still pretty organic because everything was very fast moving on our show, but um, it was a total blast. And and some of some days I just they were they were so magnificent. And um, and then we got a new a fresh little crop for when we did a, a 1960s black and white flashback. Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of fun as well. So there was lots of background as, in that scene as well. You know, I had no idea the brothers had such a tragic story and only one of them lived a longer life. Kevin, uh, all of that. Oh my God, all that tragedy and suicide and Jesus. Um, just heartbreaking. Did you have an opportunity to meet the real Kevin Von Erich? Um, that's, I know it's very interesting. It's I, when I had first, or maybe there was even something in Sean's script that when I first read and it was sort of a nod to the Kennedys. And I was thinking, well, they're not the kids. What are you talking about? I'm like, you know, they're not the Kennedys. And then when you started to learn about them, you're like, I can see completely why that there's a correlation there. Um, oh, yeah. This talented group of sons and all of this, uh, it just surrounded by all of this tragedy with, when there's so much future that nobody could live out. I mean, it was just, it was, it was incredible. It's a heartbreaking story as well. And it's so fascinating like I such admiration obviously for Kevin for the whole family the whole family seemed like a lovely family but Kevin obviously persevered and was able to you know he lived through all of this and had to process all of this and who knows uh he's the one brother left I mean it's just so it must be so much to think about um I can't even imagine I can't imagine and for us it's um yeah. it's hard to say because unless somebody from production was like hey we're working with the actual people I don't think even I don't even think to myself to reach out to anyone because yeah. we're making our own movie. It's not a documentary. It's Sean's story to tell. So I just figure, you know, just go in and do your work the way you need to do your work. Um, and I only approached anything that was like kind of public information. So if it was yeah. um, like there was, I had seen what looked like still maybe a, a museum that had some Von Eric clothing in it from the wrestling days. And I had tried to track them down like, no tomorrow to see if they were still alive and kicking and um even sent someone to our supervisor lived in texas and he went home for one week and i'm like go to the building see if it's open so and he was like it looks like it's closed up i'm like what's the name of the building and as i googled it there was a phone number i ended up calling the security guy the security guy was like i think i know someone that might still work there and then that per three phone calls in i finally got a hold of somebody who used to work there because lo and behold it had closed down but she was so nice i mean strangers just taking my phone call i don't even Hardly, I think everyone's solicitors. I hardly even like answer. And they're like being so helpful and nice and Southern hospitality and, you know, trying to help me. But it, it I, anyhow, I didn't see anything in person. I wasn't able to, uh, I didn't reach out to Kevin and it wasn't until the premiere where my whole yeah. goal on the Dallas premiere, I was like, I'm going to meet Kevin. This is going to be my big thing for tonight. So I was happy to meet him. It was a little loud. I had so many questions to ask him, but I was just happy to say, hi, I admire your incredible person. I felt very honored to work on your story. And that was about that. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to end things there. Uh, the Iron Claw will be released in theaters on December 22nd. Jen Starzik, best of luck to you this award season. And thanks for joining us today at Gold Derby. Uh, my pleasure, Ray. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.